Welcome everybody to the CPTSD podcast. This is season five, episode three, and today we have a guest. I'm here today with Kim Matthias, and she has created an amazing resource. And Kim, we're going to get into this. I think definitely for therapists, but perhaps for individuals as well, depending on where you are in your treatment. Kim, you have created an amazing flashcard and guidebook. I'm going to hold it up. Um, set for working with trauma. And I am really interested to learn in this conversation today how your amazing decade of work in the mental health field led you to create something that is so relatable and usable. And so I'm wondering if you would just start us off with a little bit about who you are and what inspired this project. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. So I am um, an art psychotherapist working in the NHS in the UK um, within secondary mental health care. And I also kind of have a, I have a background of being a support worker um, and a teacher actually m many years ago. And when I began working in the NHS, what I was quite struck by was the amount of time that we have to work with people. So we have like an, you know, maximum, I mean, I mean, it sounds like quite a lot of time, but actually for, I think for a lot of people that we work with, it's not actually very much time. You have 18 months, um, one hour sessions. Um, and as I was doing my learning, I learned a lot from listening to podcasts and I learned a lot from reading audio books and the rest of it. And I kind of came across a lot of different theories that really inspired me. So I began to draw doodles. I've kind of got my little diary here. I mean, this, this isn't the right, this isn't the right diary, but I'll just kind of draw a little doodle at the end of once a week. Um, and then what I noticed is that these doodles started becoming kind of little diagrams, little illustrations that I'd show, show people I'm working with. Okay, so this is the window tolerance or this is this. And then that that, that felt quite helpful. And so the polyvagal theory, it felt so to explain. So I started doing these little illustrations, these little drawings. Um, and then that grew into thinking, okay, if this really helps me, then this really might help the people I'm working with. And so I kind of created a little book and then they started doing their own book. And I think I've been working this way for a few years, actually. And I used to do it right at the end of working with people. What I'm noticing, what I've begun to see people are really up right at the beginning is really helpful. Mm. Um, and so I've kind of, yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it was a method that I've created working with the people I work with for a good fears and noticing how helpful it was remarkably helpful and I mean I'm noticing just a couple of things uh in what you're saying that I can really relate to and the first is the limited amount of time that you may have mm -hmm. with somebody and um is it monthly over there eight for 18 weeks yeah so we have to right and for so our we, sessions yeah yeah and here in America frequently it's 12 sessions total which yeah. is yeah. ridiculous <laughs> I mean yeah, I love this because the psychoeducation piece of psychotherapy is crucial. And yet it takes up a lot of time. And so uh, people can end up feeling like they're not getting any traction. Mm. And so I can see where creating drawings, but also having your clients create their own books was really helpful. One of the things that I've noticed about this is the cue to the visual part of our mind is really helpful. And the cards that you created are beautiful. Usually I'm drawing stick figures <laughs> with, you know, a horrible, uh, it, I'm not sure you could interpret the picture if I wasn't talking somebody through it. And so having a base of visual information and stimulation, I can see where that would be really helpful for a lot of clients. How has that worked in your experience? What have you noticed? Okay. Um, and so, I mean, I work in a service, which is we have, you know, I work with an amazing team that's um, got lots of psychologists in our team, quite CBT heavy and quite handout heavy. Um, and so what I'm noticing for a lot of the psychoeducational material that we have to offer is handouts, which is great for people that are able to respond well to handouts. But 
for some people I've worked with, like, you know, I, I mean, I remember working with one gentleman years ago and he just had this massive folder that he'd just carry with every single handout that anyone's ever given him. Yeah. And he wasn't able to make use of it. It almost just felt like this this brick that he carried around with him. And I was, you know, what what makes it what I what inspires me about creating a toolkit is rather than being given like a file where you file your handouts, you're given a sketchbook and you're given a range of different art materials and you slow down the process. You really slow it down and you make it personal to you. Um, and so people can make it, you know, if they're into textiles and they can make it, in, you know, can make it in a little bag that they hang over the door or they can make it into cards if they prefer to have cards or they can kind of, um, yeah, and there's choices within the toolkit as well. So you could either just use them purely as flashcards and some people I've worked with have used it for that purpose and they've, they've done very well from that. Or they can copy the image and just change up the colours a little bit. Or they are able to make it totally into into their own, um, and I talk about how people how people have them three different levels within that. But I just think it just gives people more agency and more creativity, and a sense of playfulness and a sense of ownership, which I think is really key um, for a lot of people that I've worked with. You know, yeah, yes, absolutely. I love everything you just said, especially the part about slowing it down and making it your own so that you have some agency in the process. That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about why um, imagery or creativity alongside psychoeducation education can be helpful, you know, in healing from trauma? Well, I think, you know, I'm, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I know it's something to do with the right brain, <laughs> right side, of, if, if you want to call it that. I mean, I know it's it's a lot more complicated than that, but I think, you know, for for a lot of people, it's, it's, I, I, think, I think bringing in a bit of curiosity and a bit of creativity and a bit of colour helps that kind of rational thinking part of your brain come a little bit more online, which helps to integrate um them kind of from three parts of our brain if you want to call it um yeah and 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 there is something about kind of linking up the I mean I'm I'm EMDR trained as well so but I guess it's not my area to speak about all this more the more science I mean I guess that's where the images come <laughs> I try to explain it the best I can and can, can in the book but I think there is something about the, weaving the creativity and the kind of and and the words because within the book you have um, little little summaries of, of of each kind of theory, if you like, or each vi visual image that people can print out and put alongside um, their their own personal image. And so there is something about it, the, the interweaving, if you like, of the right and the left brain that I think is really helpful. Um, it's not my area to go into it, it, in too much depth, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I just know from my experience that it is it, it is really helpful, you know. Um, yeah. it can be really helpful, not for everybody, but, but for people that want to work that way, it can be really helpful. I completely agree. And I wonder what you think, uh, free flowing thoughts here. I wonder what you think about not only integrating and connecting different parts of the brain, but also, also just different parts of us, mm. right? Maybe some of the younger parts that want the color and understand things, um, yeah. more simply, that doesn't mean less intelligently right yes yeah. at a different level so yeah I, I think this is a great resource yeah mm -hmm. thank you my my pleasure so um I'm gonna kind of deviate just for a minute because I got excited when we were talking about the idea of this interweaving and um I'm referencing your book again one of my favorite uh pieces or cards and then pages out of this is called ventral vagal anchors and I enjoy that not only because the image is great and I'm going to show it um, in just a minute for those of us who are looking at YouTube. Um, you can go there and see a picture of it. But on the side, it gives really direct, clear ideas about how do you do this? And so you're taking an idea like anchors is one idea plus ventral vagal, you know, and integrating that with really simple approaches. And again, simple doesn't mean unintelligent. You know, it's like the most elegant, direct way to get there. 
I can see where this would be really helpful, especially for clinicians in practice to organize thoughts around these things. How do you see this being used in clinical practice? I mean, the, this whole toolkit is is a um, in, an invitation for people to begin to um, to oh, visual visual resourcing, not visual resourcing, visual referencing. And so I'm referencing Deb Dana with that. I mean, that's that's one of her ideas. Um, and so the whole book is visual referencing. But I guess what I'm really interested in is Deb Dana explained. I mean, I couldn't read Steve Stephen Porges's work and that makes sense. Deb Dana translated it to me in a way that I was able. Okay, that makes sense. And what I'm interested in is how I can then translate that to the person I'm working with in a very short amount of time. So that makes sense to them. So it begins to lower that sense of shame and blame. Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 it is, uh, you know, I'd love to take credit for it, but it's, it's not mine. <laughs> you know, it, it, none of the book is mine. It's just kind of, it's taken from, um, lots of kind of, you know, stand, what is it, what is the saying? Standing on the shoulder of giants or sitting on the shoulder of giants or something. It feels very much like that was, you know, um, that was Deb Dana's and I visually referenced that because I thought that was a really helpful way of thinking about or, or beginning to think thinking about resource anchoring um in a way that really connects the polyvagal theory connects the nervous system um yeah well I Is really that, appreciate uh, that you're uh, you know referencing and appreciating your sources and dev data is absolutely very helpful um Stephen Porges what it took me days to digest a seminar of his that I went to yeah. However, I do want to just say, yep, these are maybe her ideas and the way of explaining them, but what you've created is also fully yours because I have never, ever seen anybody, especially in such a complete way, lay this out in an accessible way as well. And so I'm wondering if you can give us any stories or information about how you've used this in your own practice and where you see impact. Well, usually when I begin working with people, then we, you know, um, I, I mean, I mean, the, the whole point of the cards is you can start anywhere, really. But I would go through the first 12 cards, um, the, how, the first six cards, how trauma affects the brain, and then the next six cards about how trauma affects the body. And then I'll explain to them, look, any of the other kind of... Um, methods that we're going to talk about after this we're going to keep linking it back to them first 12 cards because I guess I think you know before I learned this myself people used to say oh just teach teach people to breathe or teach people to learn to be kind to themselves or mindful and I never used to explain it you know and it just felt really invalidating actually if that's the right word or but once people begin to understand some of the science about why this is helpful then they're more willing to uh, to try on different methods to see what works. And that's what works quite well when you do this individually of people is that they can try it on and go, oh, no, that, that wasn't helpful. Okay, so we can try this one or we can try this one. And sorry, I, I've gone off track to have a remind me of the question again. It was... <laughs> No, you're answering it exactly, which is how have you seen this, you know, actually roll out? Yes. In your clinical oh, yes. Practice? And so we'll go for the first 12 cards and then we'll go, you know, I'll, I'll, um, what's the word? I'll invite them to begin to create their own window tolerance. And that's just, that's so interesting because some people will keep quite close to the original. Um, some people will, I think I've worked with someone before and they kind of, you know, they, they did one big window that had a, a, a willow, no, 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 a, a big oak tree. And that's when they knew that their window tolerance is nice and wide and a really small window on the left of a willow tree with the window closed. And that was her window tolerance. And she didn't include any words of that. So she really kind of stamped her own stamp on it. And, you know, that made sense to her for quite a lot of people. Then they, they will create something that's quite similar and just change up the colors. And then I'd invite them to do their personal profile map, which is kind of their polyvagal ladder. And that's really helpful because it feels like it connects it a bit more to the body 
and then the resource anchor. And then we kind of, you know, we will just have sessions as per normal. But I guess this is why the toolkit was created. I just kept coming back to the same metaphor. Mm -hmm. I've And some metaphors will work for some people and other metaphors will, won't work for them and a different metaphor would work for them. But actually they're quite repetitive in some ways. So you've got six cards on trauma and full mindfulness. And actually they're probably saying quite a similar thing, but in a slightly different way um, to see which shoe fits, if that makes sense. And so, so for a lot of, you know, and sometimes a client will come in and they've just had such a terrible week or things have happened to them where they can't, they, they, you know, they, they can't think, they can't take on new information. So we just drop it all and then just focus on more kind of, you know, art psychotherapy, um, playfulness, creativity, connection, and don't bring any psychoeducation in. So I guess it all depends on the individual that's working with them and what's helpful for them. And that's the best answer every time, right? Is that yeah. what is going yeah. to work with a person sitting in front of you? I really exactly. like the way that this toolkit, this um, resource creates both stability and flexibility. That's the first thing I noticed. And that really, to me, is an indicator of a good tool because mm -hmm. I can take it and use it in the way that a client will receive it or a patient will receive it. And mm -hmm. That's that is amazing, and that's being attuned to our client. Right? Yeah. So, Kim, I don't know if you're aware, but I started off my professional um, life working with children and doing play therapy. And so, um, I'm not an art therapist, and in the United States, you have to be credentialed to say that you are. However, I do use art and therapy, and that's not the same thing, right? So, could we talk about that just for a minute? The the creativity process and what art might be in therapy. Um, one of the reason I want to talk about this and, you know, you can always say no, um, is I do a modality in my practice called chakra dance. And it is a combination practice where there is movement, there is meditation, but at the end, there's a mandala where people take whatever they just experienced and put it into a sacred circle. And sometimes, a lot of times actually, that's the most powerful part for people. Yes. And I have never figured out why, and I don't need to. I mean, I have my own ideas about why, but um, I'd love for you, if you're willing to talk a little bit about creativity and playfulness and how that comes out in our expression as humans. Yeah, it's a really big. I think it's a big topic. Yeah, well, it's 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 massive, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of, I mean, it's it's part of, it's it's part of our birthright as being humans. And I think when we've, when people have had just awful things happen to them, it's like you know that, but maybe they haven't experienced much play, growing up you know, or creativity or but they've just been survival brains. So they haven't been able to access that. And I think, you know, I mean, this toolkit is not designed for art therapists. It's designed for uh, everybody, really. And it's kind of that is it, it is it is part of our healing, I think. It's part of our healing to be able to create and for us to be able to play and for us to be able to explore and get a sense of what works and what doesn't work and you know, and 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 I also think that trauma, particularly, it really steals. You know, it, it kind of it can steal one's identity, and art or creativity is a really lovely way of being able to help someone recover their identity for them to find that again. Um, yeah, yeah, and maybe discover parts that have never been allowed to come out because there was no exactly. space, room, or safety for that. Yeah, yeah. Some of the most moving pieces of art that I've seen, um, and you know, I used to have kids draw a lot, but they have other ways of making art too. Yeah. You know, uh, but just sticking with drawing, it has been amazing to me to watch a child who is not very verbal, six or seven years old, but still not talking a lot just because they don't have space for that in their life. Mm -hmm. Draw out a scene, positive or negative. It doesn't really matter what the content is always. Mm -hmm. Drawing it out and putting that energy out of themselves and into art or creativity 
they come out of those sessions a little more whole. Yes. I, and I mean, you can literally see it happening a lot mm -hmm. of the times right then real time, like something is resealing or reconnecting, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. or maybe even being born. So yeah. um, I'm wondering, and this is completely, I'm catching you off guard here, uh, but do you have a story of beauty like that where you've seen somebody just come into themselves through understanding themselves differently in this visual capacity yes this is, uh, I think I think I think one time I work I think this is this is a very a bit of a rusty one but the one that kind of comes to mind is actually had nothing to do with a toolkit but some um somebody I worked with and I feel feeling a bit stuck, what to draw, what to paint. And so one technique that I often kind of um invite people to do is that they make a mark on the on on the on the on a large piece of paper and I will make a mark. Um and she made a mark. And I just noticed that she was just, you know, she didn't need me. <laughs> so I didn't I didn't offer to make a mark. I just let her just let her work. And then she carried on working. And then I think she finished the image and she said something like oh that looks like a cage that looks like a cage and it was yellow I remember and then I just said oh can we just look at it from different angles and so when I would turn it landscape and then turn it upside down and we turn it the other way around and we actually noticed when we turned it upside down it no longer looked like a cage it looked like a light Ooh. um it looked like um one of them little kind of lanterns that you can you can get with all the light pouring out of it and I pointed that out to her and we'll be and it just started a conversation about her own inner light um and it really it really shifted something for her <laughs> I was quite I was quite taken back how you know and and it's not like she didn't kind of have struggles but there was there was a real shift in the way that she viewed herself um and more of a kind of sense of her being able to really Rather than identifying with a, you know, identifying with the, uh, the number of different personality disorders that, you know, because psychiatrists and other mental health professionals have given her over the years, who just really began to identify with the light. Um, and that created a real shift, I think. That's really lovely. Yeah. And yeah, I love that you were noticing she didn't need you, right? Yeah. But she needed the knowing that you could be there. If yeah, needed you. And I mean, that's one thing a lot of us with CPTSD did not get as kids is the understanding mm -hmm. that we have backup, we have mm -hmm. support, right? And we have somebody sitting by us, you in this case, who will be there and just experience with us. That is so healing. Mm -hmm. You know, do you mind if I share a quick story with you as the oh, I please, was thinking please. of because of what you said? So this is about me. So I don't mean to be grandiose, but I was so triggered by something, not that you said it was years ago. I took a class on Jungian psychology and we were supposed to write a paper, but me being brazen, I asked my professor if I could do some painting instead about the topic. And he said, yes, but it has to be good painting, not, not meaning like quality art, but like meaningful, right? Mm. And so, um, so he allowed me to do that. And, uh, and he held on to those paintings for a while. And I remember going to visit his office while my paintings were still there. And one of them was turned upside down to this day. Just right now, I'm like, it doesn't go like that. You know? Wow, yeah, and yeah. So, and, and there was a reverse of flow in the way things were working in that painting. And it just threw me for a loop. I'm curious, mm. what do you think happened in my experience of, you know, being caught off guard by how much that impacted me well it wasn't done between it wasn't it wasn't something that you both agreed to was it <laughs> you That's know what I mean it wasn't it wasn't something that was done between the two of you where it was kind of I mean I guess with this um the lady that I'm thinking of when we started turning her paint there was a real sense of curiosity and it was it was about the process mm -hmm. it wasn't about the final image and it was a real sense of curiosity what does it look like this way what does it look like this way what oh that looks quite different that way and I think she was the one that said it looks like a light <laughs> you know and so it's almost like she she made these discoveries I mean I 
or I mean, it was, I mean, yeah, or, or I may, however it was, she, even if I said it was a like, she agreed with that statement. And actually she left with her own painting. She took her own painting home and whichever way she looks at it is up to her. You know, there's, when we talk about that sense of um, an agency and it feels like within the situation that you just explained to me, like the painting was taken off you Um and then it was turned upside, it's turned a different way around, you know, like it does, it does, it does feel like there's a spillage there, like it was actually containing when you were painting it. And then there was something quite not containing about the way he, you know, the way you discovered that, you yes, know, that's so not you recovering something that's you discovering, but not, a, but, but not a, not a particularly pleasant discovery, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Yeah. I like the way that you framed all of that. And I just want to be clear. I think that I wasn't offended that it was turned upside down uh, because yeah. I think he was trying to find art in there for himself. He was that type of person, but the shock. And so yeah. of seeing it that way. And so I really like the way you just described my experiences the having, it wasn't mutual. It wasn't an agreed upon yeah. presentation. Thank you for that. Maybe I'll have some peace now, Kim. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So I'm really interested if you're willing to share, how did you begin to work in this field um, from, uh, you said you were a teacher and I can clearly see the organization of good teaching in this toolkit. How did you transition into this type of work? Um, well, uh, as an art psychotherapist, I think I heard on the bus once when I was about 15, that was this job called you know art therapy and I got quite excited about that. Um, but I always didn't think I was clever enough. Like I was, you know, I'm quite severely dyslexic. I still don't know my ABC, still don't know my alphabet. And then I did my teacher training. And then I did support. I, I, could, I, couldn't, I couldn't teach anymore because I had this fear of public speaking. Um, I, then, then I did support work for many, many years. And then I thought, right, I'm going to do my training because that's my, that always felt like what I wanted to do ever since I was, ever since I knew that was a profession of art therapy. That's what I thought I wanted to do. So I did. So I eventually did do my art therapy training. <laughs> and then next year, I'm going to, is it this year? No, this year, I'm going to be doing my, my somatic experiencing training. So that feels like my next, which I'm quite, yeah. That's good. That, yeah, it, it feels like I know a lot of this stuff in terms of intellectually. You know, I I I had to get to know it. I know it visually. I'm really good of sim. You know, I I think I'm pretty good of symbols and explaining things through metaphors. But being in your body or, or actually being a, having a real embodied sense of that is something that I'm going to have to train for. I'm going to have to have first hand experience of myself. Um, so yeah, that's how I got into the. And, and, and then now, yeah, I told you at the beginning, but yeah. So it took. It, I, I kind of went a bit sideways to get into the line of work that I'm doing, but um, it's a good, it's a good, a good journey getting here. <laughs> well, I'm certainly grateful that you took the journey because you have benefited the world with this toolkit. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm wondering, Kim, do you have anything else that you would like to talk about or say today that would be uh, helpful as far as maybe to therapists that listen to this podcast? what they might want to consider when they begin and i know they will using this toolkit i think it just shape it and make it into your own you know kind of like we've got lots and lots of different metaphors but i use it in a particular way but i think you know you, you, it depends on like how many sessions you've got the individual that you're working with it depends on the relationship you have with that person i mean i have worked with people before when you know we just haven't gone into a toolkit at all until right at the end we work together and then I might show them the last 12 cards and I go, oh, yeah, very good. That makes a lot of sense. And that's it. So I think the beauty of it, you just you just you just use it to serve you <laughs> and to serve the individual that you're working with um, and find a way that it works for you. And hopefully there's enough kind of room in, in there for people to do that. I believe there's room in there to do that for sure. And I noticed that you are talking consistently about the first 12 cards. So I think it might be helpful for our audience to know a little bit about what those cards are, right? And also, if you want to talk about it, the ladder of polyvagal theory and how that works in relation to this toolkit or however you want, those might be interesting for us to hear about. What is it? Okay, shall I? I mean, I haven't got the actual cards with me. I've kind of got what I show what I show what I show people I work with 
Um, and I can't see my image underneath, so I don't know what, yeah, which, but I don't know whether you can see that, okay? Yes, a little bit higher and it would be, yep, perfect, yes. Not too much shine? Nope, it's okay. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> getting me a bit. So it's kind of the first um, 12, the first six cards are like this. Mm -hmm. I should have brought my card. Why didn't I bring my card? <laughs> And so they're just kind of a quite metaphor heavy and really, really simplified. I mean, it's kind of people that really know their stuff, they'll look, they'll look at this and I'll go, oh my God, she's missed out so much. But you kind of have to. I mean, I think I think I wrote it in the tool, toolkit guide. It is like trying to fit the ocean into a puddle. But my main focus is, is like, how do we lower the shame and the blame? That's kind of, that's that, that's what I'm, that's what I'm interested in. Um, so anything that doesn't really kind of um, that doesn't really tackle that goes on the cutting board, goes goes on the cutting room floor, if that's what you want to call it. Um, and there's the yeah. anchors. Yeah, there's the anchors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so yeah, I mean, I mean the the polyvagal theory. I mean. It's, it's so, I mean, would it be helpful if I just showed you the picture and I explain it to how I explain it, how I would explain it to people, someone I'm working with? Yes. Okay. Which is very, very, um, can you see that okay? Yep. Yeah. And so polyvagal theory was created by Stephen Porges and he kind of created this, um, hierarchy in terms of our nervous system and i've used a lot of metaphors for this so i've imagined that the, the brain is our tree if you like and our nervous system or our autonomic nervous system our ans if you want to call it is the tree roots that go right down to our feet right down to our hands right down to our arms all over our body and stephen poor just had um uh, Deb Dana, who's a social worker that kind of managed to get hold of his work and really simplify it for the masses for us to understand. And she created this kind of um, um, the polyvagal ladder, I think it's called, where you kind of have these different, um, we, we can imagine the ladders beside you and we kind of have these different, oh, I can't remember what they're called now, traffic lights, <laughs> where we could read orange and red. And I have from Steve, Steve just actually, and I could add them into this ladder. And so we can divide our nervous system into three main sections. And so what I would kind of, we have the green section, what I call the green section, which is the vent, um, vent vagal section, which is when we're feeling safe and social. We have the orange section, which is our sympathetic, our fight flight. And if we notice the cards, the, the, um, the card, probably why I don't have the cards with me actually, but the, 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 the printing, you can't see it so finely, but you kind of have the orange around that, around the arms and you have the orange around the legs as well. And so the orange section or the sympathetic section is, you know, when our heart beats, is beating really fast. And then we had the red section, which is the dorsal vagal, which is more um, linked in with our freeze and shutdown. And I can explain a bit better in the book about what that's about, but that's when our heart rate goes really, really slowly. We So we tend to rest when they're in this section. Um, and if someone's had a, like a childhood of relative safety where they felt safe enough growing up, then they're able to anchor themselves a bit more into the, into, into their green section or vent, their ventral vagal section. I mean, I just talk in colour, so I might just say the green section when I work with people. They can anchor themselves in the green section a little bit more. And so when they kind of, if if they need to go into that kind of orange or red section, then it's appropriate. It's like, it's, it's because we need to. But when people have experienced kind of um, adverse life effects or trauma, is that they tend to lose their anchor up in the green section. And so for a lot of people I've worked with, then they will keep um, going from the orange and the red section a lot of the time. And they're trying to get to green, but they really struggle to do that. And so it's, and um how do I explain it? 
How do I explain it better? I mean, I, I will tend to use for all of the six cards. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it might take kind of like about 15, 20 minutes of me just to explain that. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you're able to anchor yourself, if you don't have an anchor up here, then the orange section can become danger. And if you don't have the anchor up here, then the red section be becomes, becomes life threat, actually, when our heart goes really slowly, when we do feel like, you know, we're going to die. And if we do have the anchor up here, then the orange section becomes play if it's not a real threat. And if we have our anchor up here, then the red section becomes stillness. Um, and so we're able to do things like go to sleep without sleeping tablets or or meditate, you know, this is why I call it trauma-informed mindfulness, because actually kind of mindfulness, if you've had a trauma history, it, it can be very, very activating for the nervous system. And then when I explain it to people I work with, which people are able to explain, is, is I, I might use a kind of like a real life story about that, someone that I've worked with a few years ago and just explain to them, you know, before I knew this stuff, I worked with this person and they just couldn't meditate. They couldn't go to the meditation room and lie down in the beanbag and relax and listen to kind of, you know, they felt most comfortable, of course, because they were really activated. And so they felt most comfortable when they were kind of going around that park, you know, people from the outside will say, oh, that person's got an eating disorder or oh, they're an alcoholic, but actually they were just in flight, you know, so we, if they've been in shutdown, it's so much better to feel in the orange. You want to feel in danger. You don't want to feel like threat is, is a bit better. And I think the whole point of kind of, my work with people is being able to learn how to anchor themselves in the green and to differentiate, is that the right, am I saying that properly? Differentiate what's a, you know, what's a, a real danger um, and what's a, a cue of danger. What's like an old tape, you know? Um, and same with the life threat as well. And, 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 oh my God, that's so easy to say, but it's incredibly difficult to do. I mean, I often use a metaphor of like, this is like learning a different language. You know, this is like learning French. And so let's kind of pretend that I'm the, I'm the, I, I'm the client and you're the therapist and, and I, you know, you, you're asking me to learn French in a year. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to learn that, but what you can do is you can learn the tools and you can be, you can, you know, this is like driving lessons, you know, you're going to learn how to drive when you're out there, when you're kind of, um, the, the real life practice if you like in the real world you know mm -hmm. and if I'm able to kind of if people are up for taking some of the skills that work for them they're if able to practice them outside session that's when shifts can happen yes and I thank you so much for all of that information and that explanation I really appreciated how you were talking about the experience of energy flow through the body Mm -hmm. even though you didn't use those exact words, right? And yeah. that having those anchors in the green where you're safe mm -hmm. and secure enough. Now, let's remember enough people because, yeah. you know, you don't have, an, have to have an idyllic childhood or life to be safe enough. Yeah. Um, that, that we're interpreting the information or the energy differently depending on those anchors. And mm -hmm. so that fight or flight energy could be play and expansion if it's mm. in a positive, safe environment and we understand what's going on. Mm. I really appreciated that. And I also really appreciate if I can just glow on you for a minute that you're talking about shame and blame and disarming those. Mm. And those are therapy killers. Those are healing killers, you know, and they're also really interwoven in most of our lives. Those of us that have CPTSD, especially from childhood, like mm. the whole thing was shame and blame. And so mm. when you're talking about learning a different language, 100% yes. Mm. I think this is even harder than learning a different language because yeah. when you're trying to learn a language, your body and your brain isn't actively fighting against you learning that language mm -hmm. like you do in yes. CPTSD. And so the fact that you can come in with visual cues, with the idea of maybe even coloring in, in the sketchbook or you know whatever it is, can kind of go underneath the resistance. And I don't mean that in a, you're a bad client kind of way. It's a mm -hmm. healthy actually resistance to keep us safe. We can fly mm -hmm. underneath that without harming and without triggering real beauty and magic can happen there. Mm, yes. Thank you so much for this tool and for going through that ladder in a way that was really clear and beautiful. I've heard that explained many times and 
your explanation was chef's kiss. Oh, I, I, I edited it out a lot, but hopefully it makes still make sense. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I am aware of our time and I just want to check in and see how your time is doing. Yes, Do that's have- fine. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Do you have anything else that you would like to talk about? And I'm going to edit this question, me asking you that directly. You know, anything else that you would like to put into this um, podcast? I think I'm fine. Yeah, it was, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've just started trying to explore this thing of groups, exploring using this way in group work, more short term, um, within my kind of, yeah, within within my job role. And I've kind of done a, a pilot group. I'm still learning. <laughs> it's quite different as yes. it, working within a group than, than, than working individually. But still, you know, I'm, st- I'm still chipping away at that one. <laughs> Would you like to talk about that a little more explicitly or... Are you um, like you want to learn? No, I, I, I guess, I guess I'm saying that it can, it could be used with groups as well. But I, as, I mean, and the bonus of it is that people feel a bit more connected and they're able to kind of, you know, um, have a shared sense of difference and similarities, you know. Mm-hmm. And I guess the difficulty of, with running this um, method of a group is that sometimes people are left with quite difficult feelings and they don't have anywhere to take that to because <laughs> a group doesn't always um, offer the space to do that, you know, or they, or, or they just feel too terrified in a group. So I'm still, I'm still wrestling with that and working out about how that works in a mental health team, but I'll keep going. Yeah. Right. You're, you're looking for the off ramp when people are overloaded or maybe mm-hmm. couldn't experience yeah. the group that's yeah planning thank you for that too so um, oh thank you so much it's been really enjoyable speaking to you today thank you my pleasure it's been enjoyable speaking with you too and just to be really clear where can therapists locate this toolbox or this toolkit if they want um to- i think if it, if they just put my name in it, there's lots of different places that come up so i think it, it sold you know it's sold in most places i think they like barnes and no- noble is it and amazon and um yeah if we just put my name in um kim, yeah kim Matthias trauma recovery toolkit then it will come up yeah okay that's how i found it and then uh, you generously sent me one which i am appreciating yeah. very much Um, And I guess my final thoughts today are if and when you do complete your somatic experiencing training and then you create another toolkit, please tell me about it because uh, (laughs) getting into your body can be very complicated when you have Mm. trauma, especially any type of physical or even sexual trauma, of course, that has occurred. So Mm. um, Kim, I think we're going to see more great things from you. And I appreciate oh. you contributed to our field and look forward to hearing more about you. Oh, thank you, Tapfa. Thank you. You're welcome. And um, we're going to close out now. Okay, brilliant. Okay. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.